and community. Okay. Got well, hello. Can you hear me okay on this? Is this working? I, I can talk loud, so if the microphone is not working so much, I'll, uh, I'll just be uh, I use my outside voice. Well, I'm, I'm delighted to be here, and I want to thank Don, the Community Engagement Corps, and Towards Education for inviting me to join you. And uh, I did come with a PowerPoint of sorts um, that I think I can work. It does work. Uh, I, I, I want to say that I have some major things that I want to visit with you about. And there are a number of people in the room who I know, who I've worked with in the past, who work with me at the Center for African American Health, who were on the Community Engagement Corps that I was there, and I'm so happy to see all of them. So I've been retired for the last four years, so I'm living six Saturdays and a Sunday. That's the way my... <laughs> So I'm, I'm hoping all of the folks that I know in the room won't be too critical of me because I'm going to be telling them stuff that they already know quite well. But uh, let me just start by saying that I, I, I'm curious to know how many of you in the room uh, have had some experience with community engagement that went well or even not so well. Would you raise your hand if you've had some experience with it? Yeah, that's great. So what I'd like to underscore at the beginning is that together, together, we're all experts. We're experts together on this matter of community engagement. So some of what I talk to you about won't be brand new, but some of the themes that I'll underscore uh, in all of my talk that I want you to be mindful of is that community engagement, in my view, has to do with relationships and trust and I want you to think when you're doing community engagement about the concept of dating and then marriage, dating before marriage. And I especially want you to be mindful of what I call the magic words. The, the magic words in community and in family and in so many venues, the magic words are, I need your help. I, I have two adult sons and I know that if you were to ask them something about the notion that their dad has talked to them from the time that they were young about the magic words that they would know exactly what you're talking about. I need your help. So I am not, I am not going to advance some definition of community for you, nor am I going to try to offer some definition of community engagement because I think there are versions of it out there and you know both of them as well as I do. But let me, let me just underscore something else about community. So in community, there are communities within community. And what I mean by that is that schools, churches, small business, cultural and ethnic groups, community-based organizations, youth, elderly, LBGTQ populations, these families, these and more are communities within community. And when I think about them, I think about some of how some of my work advanced starting when I was at the Teton Foundation as a program officer. I, I got involved in working with churches because we were, my portfolio at the foundation had to do with strengthening neighborhoods. And my objective was to reach out to people that had the capacity to help me reach the community engagement. And I had in mind at that time, given my own background as an African American, that the church as a community within community would be a good place to start. Because the church is a community within community and it doesn't have a geographical boundary because it serves largely I think about the black church as my target did, largely without a geographic boundary, served lots of African Americans, not just African Americans, but mostly African Americans. And that's, that's what I was trying to reach. 
And so we developed this relationship with uh, a number of black churches. We had 50 or 60 that were involved loosely, and we got maybe 30 involved more intensely. And when our work started drifting toward health, we call that partnership Faith and Health Ministry. Faith and Health Ministries, in a lot of ways, was the precursor to what we did in an organization that became the Center for African American Health. Now, you may have heard this from Lucille before, but the Center for African American Health uh, did a lot of work on a lot of fronts around evidence-based programs, diabetes management programs, breast cancer management programs, fall prevention programs for older adults. We had home blood pressure monitoring programs that we partnered with Linda and some other folks on as a community-based participatory research effort in some ways. So we had some experience working with researchers and working with black churches together and we thought that we were powerful in our ability to reach people through black churches. Now, one of the projects that we had in the Center for African American Health was uh, prostate screening with men. And there were others doing prostate screenings with men, uh, African-American men and others, but targeting men of color because African-American men has, have the largest prostate cancer rate in the world. Uh, Denver Health was one of them. And they were annually screening 110, 150 or so men. And we were screening about that number two at two events, uh, annual health fair and something that we did with the inner city health center at some point in time in our relationship with pastors we found five or six pastors that became champions uh, and what they did as champions is that they agreed to be screened for prostate cancer because nobody loves that they agreed to do it and they agreed to tell encourage the men in their church to do it as well so that year, that year when they did that, it went from 100 or so men that we screened that year to nearly 300. Now, I, I want to I tell you that story because that's the example of what happens when you think about champions in community and organizations and institutions <laughs> that are communities within communities. So let me just ask you this rhetorical question. When you think of community, what do you really mean? Do you mean neighborhoods? And you know, Denver is a city of neighborhoods. Not every city is like that. Some cities are, like I grew up in New Orleans, some cities are defined by their wards. I, I lived in the ninth ward. And some cities are defined other kind of ways. Uh, but Denver is uniquely a city of neighborhoods. Five Points, Globeville, Curtis Park, Swansea. If you ask a lot of people when you're in Denver, where do you live? They'll say, I live in Montbello. I live in Curtis Park. Because that's the way Denver thinks of itself as a city of neighborhoods. So when you think of community, you may think of it as neighborhoods, or you may think of it as a zip code. You know, we've been hearing all the information about how zip codes can be can define health status in some ways or not, <laughs> or census tracts, <coughs> or specific populations. If you think about neighborhoods as low-income neighborhoods, now a lot of low-income people in neighborhoods don't like to be defined as low-income neighborhoods, but that's the way they can be referred to from time to time. And as I said, churches in neighborhoods, the black church community, that is a community within community once again. I say this once again because this underscores how when you're thinking about research and community engagement, it is more, more precise than is generally implied when you say community. Right? So let me just touch on a few things that you that I know that you know already, but I think it's important to pay attention to. Um, you know already that it's important in your research effort to be clear about the purpose. Clear about the purpose in the sense that you want to know what is it that you want from community and what is it that you bring to them? And how do you talk to them about money? I use money because there's a lot of things to talk to them about, but I say, how do you talk to community about money? Because we'll say more about that in a little bit. But money will come up 
all of the time. Uh, when you think about engaging community around a research effort, one of the really important things is to use your research skills to learn about the community. Now I'm going to emphasize that in just a moment. But you want to learn about the community because if you've not gone to that community before, it's really important that you spend some time on the front end learning about who are the leaders, who are the organizations that the community looks up to, who are the respected players uh, in the community, who are the activists. It's critical that you know that before you step out in the community. You want to use you want to use, this is what you know, you want to use the experience of your colleagues. I mentioned that together we're experts, but if you've got research colleagues that have got experience in working in community engagement, before you step out for the first time, you want to talk to them about what went well, what didn't go so well. What would you say to me I should lean into and avoid when I go into community? You want to think about the beginning of a, uh, at the the beginning the beginning. You want to think about the end. So the question of sustainability is one that I'll touch on more in a moment. But you think about the end at the beginning. So you think about whether or not this is a one-time thing, or whether or not your objective is to have a relationship with a community that you're going to engage. You want to think about power sharing. Power sharing is a big thing in community because. You have to really reflect on the notion that uh, how do you make decisions about what you're going to do together? What power do you give the community to influence your decision making? Do you bring what you're going to do to them or do you engage with them about deciding how you're going to behave in community? community this is something you know again. Community engagement is the foundation for recruitment and retention. It is by far that. So thinking about that foundation for community engagement, the foundation of recruitment and retention, that's the heart and soul of what you're going to do in research. You're looking to recruit and you're looking to retain the people that you do. Recruit. You know better than I do that most of the research grants that you submit for recruitment and retention is by far the biggest challenge. It is what comes up all of the time. So let me just touch on a few things about getting started. And the very first one is what I think can be perhaps the most important one. So if you've not been engaged in community engagement in a research effort before, or if you've done it before and you're looking to engage a new population, a new community of folks in some way, uh, the most critical thing I think you can do is to find a champion, to find someone in the community that can give you some insight into who can you talk to, who are a few people that you can talk to to give you a good sense of how to get started. And I don't mean talk to about recruiting research participants. I mean talk to about getting a grasp on how to engage the community. I want to just touch briefly on another experience I had when I was at the Piton Foundation of uh, developing a neighborhood leadership program. We ended up developing five or six, but we started off with one. And the group that I engaged were small businesses. And I went to small businesses throughout the community, throughout the neighborhoods that I targeted, Five Points, the West Side. And I talked to people like barbershops, owners, and dry cleaners and small restaurants. And what I want to know from them is, if you were forming a committee of folks in your neighborhood to make it a better place to live, who would you want on that committee that's not an elected official? And the names that, I thought I knew a lot about the communities at the beginning. The names they gave me were people that I didn't know, everyday, everyday residents. And then I asked them, who, who would you want to chair the committee? More great names. And so that's how we started the neighborhood leadership program. And we ended up with programs in five different communities. Now, I say to you this first thing about establishing 
uh, a contact or someone that can give you a sense of who to talk to and how to get started. This is the person, whether it's a church or a small business or a school or a community-based organization that you can say, who can I have a conversation with about getting started? What should I pay attention to? What, I sh what should I be cautious about? And I want to say to you that those names, five or six people, those names of people that you talk to, you want to talk to them at the place of the person that referred them to you. So if it's a church, ask the pastor, who can I talk to that lives in this neighborhood that I'm thinking about working? And can I talk to them here at your church? And I would argue that when you invite them to have a conversation with you about getting started, pay them. Pay them to do it. So think about this now. If you, <coughs> if you were going to talk to five or six people in a neighborhood that you're thinking about working in, and you're going to ask them some key questions about what should I attend to? What should I avoid? How should I talk about these matters? How should I start the conversation? What should I be worried about? Right? If you were going to pay them each $30 to sit with you for an hour and your brand didn't provide that, pay them out of your pocket. Now I look around and see you guys are dressed nice. You could afford to pay $150 for this information. And I would argue that if you can't get paid the $150 you need to talk to five or six people, it would be worth your $150 to invest in having these conversations. Uh, and you'd be really happy about it at the end because this is something you're doing at the beginning. And what are some of the things you want to know from them? This is what you want to know. You want to know a lot about what language do you use? How do I talk to people that live in the community? Uh, a lot of people in the community, if they live in what you think of as a minority community, they don't like that language. They don't like that description. And what are the alternatives? That's, that's some of what you want to engage them about. The other thing is that you want to build relationships with your prospective partner at the top, middle, and at the grassroots. So what do I mean by that? So if you're planning to partner with a nonprofit, with a community-based organization, you don't just want to be engaged with the director. You want, to, you want to build a relationship with some of their staff to the extent that you're encountering their staff. I know, Lucille will verify this, I know that at the Center for African American Health, our receptionist was a really nice lady. She was the person that people encountered when they first came to our office. I often had people that wanted to come and talk to me about the prospect of working with me on something, or partnering with me, or getting a connection to pastors or something. If they talked to my receptionist about it and she liked them, she would make sure that I talked to them. She would be the key person because it might be somebody I didn't know. You know what I mean? And so uh, the idea that you talk to the top, the middle, and the front line, the relationship that you have with all of you can pay big, big dividends for you. So I, I want to say this about the idea of post, I say post, I mean after your research project is done, after you finish the research project, I'm aware that many of you that have done research projects before have unfunded demands on you. You know the report that you write at the end is after the grant is run out, the money is run out, but you've still got this report to write. And it's either a report for the funder or for the institution. And the question is, uh, what happens after you've completed the research project? How do you sustain the relationship? So I argue that the people that you work with often have a big complaint about how they partnered with some researcher. And then after the project is complete, they never hear from you again. So sending a postcard, stopping by to say hello, 
um, making a phone call to say, oh, I've been thinking about you. I just want you to know again how much I enjoyed working with you. That, that pays big dividends, big dividends for you. I want you to consider as part of your research effort and community engagement, that community engagement is not just getting what you want for the research project. Research is one of the main objectives you have, but relationship building, it is relationships all the way down. Most nonprofits, for example, if that's who your partner is, has some kind of special event. To the extent that you would volunteer for that event, or do something that would be helpful to them that only would take a couple of hours out of your time can pay big dividends, not just for the current research project, but you want to think about the one that's happening today to benefit what might happen tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. So think next. Think about what happens after you're done. So then about sustainability. This is the this is the area in which a lot of researchers overlook and it has to do with once you have once you have had a successful research initiative what's your objective about how to sustain it how to sustain the relationship and go forward so building building a partnership so that you get to so that you get to have someone that is caring about you, someone that's aware of what you've done, someone that cares about your institution, someone that you can call again is more than just critical. It is the heart and soul of what you want to do. And the next thing that happens is that when you, when you think about your being done, when you think about how it plays out and whether or not you were successful, how do you share that information with your colleagues? How often does it happen that you end up sitting with your colleagues and talking about the failures? Because the failures are more powerful than the successes in so many cases. So that's the heart and soul of what matters in community engagement. Relationships all the way down, thinking about dating before getting married, thinking about how your partnerships, how your prospective partnerships see you, in the context of your research initiative and knowing that when you go in community, when you go in community, they're not seeing you as an expert. They're seeing you as someone that wants something from them. And in community, when you're there and you're asking someone to help you out, whether it's spoken or not spoken, you have to be mindful of the fact that they're saying to themselves, why should I do this with you? What's in it for me? That's for the participant. Now you might argue that the participant says uh, from you that what's in it for them is that they improve the health of the community, but that's not the way they're gonna see it. They wanna know what's in it. And sometimes what's in it for them means money. Am I getting paid for this? And um, what's the compensation all about? How does that work? So when you're not talking about that, you have to be mindful about it. You have to go into the community thing thinking that this is what they want to know. They want to know why. Why should I do this? Tell me the why. This is the case statement. The case statement is you're being prepared once you get into the community to answer that question. Why should I do this with you? And what's in it for me? And what's the power that I've got with you, if there's any at all? So that's my story, and I'm sticking with it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm delighted to have the follow-up questions and answers that's going to happen with me and Don, so I'll keep that in mind. All right. Thank you, Fran. So we've got, we've got a lot of time here for dialogue and discussion, and as I hope you've seen, we couldn't have a better resource. Um, and Grant Jones here to uh, talk about kind of what your thoughts are, what your concerns are about community engaged work. Um, so, you know, I've got some questions here on my list, but I'm a lot more interested in hearing what, what your questions might be. So, who would like to start us off? I think we have a time. 
Tell us who you are first. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ricardo Gonzalez. I work at Servicios de la Raza. I posted at the Mexican consulate and I uh, try to see a community where, like you were saying, it's filled with many communities. They're all Mexican and they all go to the consulate. They come from different areas. They have different interests and everything else. Like you were saying, I just uh, was thinking about marriage and I think that everybody who gets married gets married forever. Uh, uh, when you do community research, you are not getting married forever. You're getting married uh, for the brand. And I think communities suffer that. So I don't know if you have any ideas of an exit plan. I don't want to call it a divorce plan, but how do we end that relationship uh, when we lack funding or whatever? They just think that. No, it's a good question. It's a good question, and uh, you know, it's it's really I appreciate how hard it is to embrace the notion that once you do a uh, a research project with the community, that it means that it's forever. And uh, in some ways, it is forever, and I don't mean forever with all the participants in your research project. But if part of what you're doing is partnering with a community-based organization, it is forever, you know. And I want to argue that it's not hard, you know. So think about this now. Think about friends that you have. I, I, I'm kind of a loner, but I believe that you all have friends that you are really close to that you're connected with and you're talking to and reaching out to all the time. And then you have a few friends that you call as friends, but you only hear from each other once in a while, once every three or four months. Sometimes it's a text or a call or maybe a holiday call or a birthday call. But what you invest yourself in is the relationship. So you're staying in touch with them. You're letting them know that you are not there every day, but you care about them. So you have this relationship. And I would argue that, in particular, when you find a champion in a community, an organizational partner, whether it's a, a CEO, a community-based organization, or a church, or a school that you're working with around something, or a small business, I don't think it's that hard if you think about sustainability, to stay in touch with them. To let them know that, oh, this is the, this has helped me help our mission together. We've had some exchange, values exchange, and I'm staying in touch with you because you never know. But a couple of years into something else pops up, you see this great brand opportunity, and you're able to say, oh, I've got a partner community that can help me make connections, build a bridge, be a champion for what I'm trying to do with their product and their company. And some of those customers become my So I, I say yes, it's wherever it's up to. Yeah, I just I just pay back on that grant. I think <clears throat> I've been to funerals um, of people uh, that have been part of our patient, one of our patient advisory councils. Um, we celebrate, you know, life events together. It, it's yeah. I mean, it's. It is a very close relationship. Let me say just one more thing about that. Because it is, I mean, it is an important question. It's the same as it is important. And the additional thing I want to add is that um, don't think that community-based organizations that are in community and serving community don't have their own troubles, don't have their own challenges with community engagement. They do. And the reason they have, not all the reasons, but some, one of the reasons they have um, major challenges with community engagement and reaching the people that they serve is because their relationships are weak. Uh, and if you thought about someone who said, if you gave a party, I, I don't mean a party like uh, a program that's offering fall prevention. You think that everybody that needs fall prevention education is going to come to this class? Not so, not so. Uh, but if you gave a party, will people come because of you 
of the biblical program. And I, again, would argue that if you have strong relationships, they will come in large measure because of you, because they have a relationship. Right? Relationships all the way out. Other questions? So I'm Tim Lockie, I'm the admin director for the CCTSI. Bethany and I were in a meeting yesterday with Dr. Sokol, and this issue of returning results to communities kind of came up in our discussion. <coughs> And um, he made an interesting comment that he'd like to see the IRB kind of mandate some kind of a plan that's part of an, of an IRB protocol that, that involves engaging with communities. And I'm interested to see what you think about it or other comments. Um, how might we push that agenda forward? And um, maybe, you know, what, what, is it, what does it look like to return results to communities? It's different language than that progress report you're writing at the end of your grant. Yeah. So let me say something that uh, Don knows more about than I do, so I want to invite his comments uh, to add to what my rambling might be. But, uh, so I, I serve on this uh, advisory board for uh, a research innovation council at Vanderbilt. And the RIC at Vanderbilt uh, provides, under the leadership of Constrito Wilkins that Don knows well, uh, there are 11 of us on this advisory board, and they provide technical assistance to CTSAs at universities around the country. And one of the big things that we've been milling about with them as an advisory group is they're um, developing some guidance for CTSAs around recruitment and retention, and providing some guidance to them about how to develop real plans and evaluation of their recruitment and retention in part because most many CTSAs will project research numbers that they can't achieve. So they over project and they don't really have a plan about how to do that. So that's one thing I'd say is Don can have to it. But the other thing that I know a little bit more about is that I, I think someone like Ron Sokol as a PI with the CCTSI here, for folks that are involved in the community engagement work and they're feeling challenged by it or they're learning things that they think would be helpful to their colleagues and to the initiative as a whole, one of the big challenges is for the researchers to help educate their PIs. Because the researchers might hold a greater passion about how important community engagement is than their PI does. Don knows a lot about this because there's always this argument, not just to the PI here, but to uh, NIH and to NCATS and others. Uh, there's always this argument about how important is this community engagement work anyway? How important it is, how important is this learning and this investment in getting people strategies and and sometimes the researchers are, are more invested in that than the PIs are. So, yeah, I'll just uh, build on that. You know, I think I'm very glad to hear Ron suggesting that. I think um, what I would also add to it is that in a lot of the work that, that we do, we try to encourage folks and we try to practice this ourselves that. Um, we have community at our side at all steps of the project. So returning results isn't something that we're doing, oh, we, we've got the results, now we've gone through the, the analysis, we've, we've come up with the answers, <clears throat> now, let's, now let's share those with the community. We want community at our side helping us to understand what those results mean, what, what how to interpret them, um, and oftentimes that's where the real insights come, uh, is by walking that walk together. So it's great to think about returning results at the end, but I would encourage all of us to think about having folks involved at every step of the way. Other comments or questions? If you don't have questions for us, I'm going to i got a couple questions for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
I'm Jamie Stutes, a new faculty member in the uh, Department of Medicine and Cancer Center. Um, I want to talk about, ask you about one of the easy questions, and that's about money, and more specifics about how you talk to communities about money. Yeah. You mentioned bringing it up early, but could you say more? Yeah, you know, I, I mentioned something about money uh, out of your pocket. I, I wasn't trying to be funny there. I, I was really serious about the, the issue of how valuable it is to think about getting started in a neighborhood that you, in a, a community of people, if that's your target audience. I was wanting to underscore how important it is to think and invest yourself and getting off to a good start. Because getting off to a stumbling start can be disastrous, you know, because when someone else encounters a researcher come in, coming into the community to engage them about something, has a bad experience, they tell their friends. They, they tell others, ah, I didn't talk to these people from the industry campus, you know, so you know, do that. But so I, I mentioned that if, if you were if you had in mind to, to encounter five or six people that would give you some insight into what you should attend to early on, and you thought that rather than meeting with all five or six at once, that you meet with them individually, and for an hour's time you would pay them each thirty dollars. If, if, if the university or your research grant didn't pay for that, be worth your paying that money out of your pocket. The hundred and fifty dollars to talk to five or six people would be well worth it. So, this is about money that has to do with getting started, but about money that has to do with the research plan and encountering participants or community-based organization partners that would be your key bridge to your recruitment strategy. Now, I can tell you that the, the number of times in the Center for African American Health, we had a, a good number of research um, projects that we partnered with Anshu's on and some others uh, on data collection and on project things and on blood pressure monitoring. The, the, the issue of money was in my head, uh, in my head before I started talking to my partners about it, that I assumed that they were going to bring it up, that there was something that they were going to. Uh, contribute to because it's the researcher's main job, but it was my main job. I was already dancing as fast as I could as the director of an organization visiting the community. And then I had someone to come to me and say, would you be interested in doing this with me? I found that there was some value to it, it was a match to what we're doing. But I, I had expenses and costs and time of myself and my staff, and I wondered how I was covered that. You know? So the answer to your question is, so when a researcher is thinking about community engagement and finding a community partner or getting focus groups together, the matter of the money conversation has to be in your planning before you get to community. Because whether it comes to you right away or a little later on, you don't want to be caught by surprise when someone says, oh, wait a minute, how much are you going to pay me to do that? Or what's the, how big is the grant? Uh, the astute nonprofit will ask that. Wait, wait, this is a $5 million grant. And for my time, you want to pay us $500. I, I don't know what the fair amount is, but you see what I'm saying? I'm saying that anticipating the money question is critical because it will come up. And it will be spoken early or not spoken early, but it will come. So I'm in a room with the neurology department and do clinical research um, on rare diseases. And our patient population is um, not first. And um, the trials that we do are very specific to diseases that only very small portions of the community have. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you had any tips or suggestions on more effective ways to break into a community when you're not targeting a public health issue. 
So it's a good question. And this matter of, you can use the term, this matter of clinical trials has um, a lot of efficacy, a, a lot of benefit to public health, but a lot of community challenges. And I don't mean just, uh, so I mean, Things as straightforward as straightforward as the Henrietta Henrietta Lack study, or you know, the final two. People would be making a mistake if you weren't if you were thinking that a lot of people in the community don't know about Henrietta Lack and about how uh, that research benefited the field tremendously, and nothing benefited the family or or some something in the clinical trial was done that people didn't know what was happening to their blood or something so the matter of transparency becomes a critical matter transparency in clinical trials telling people what to expect what what will happen to information about them, whether it's blood or other information, will it be shared with other researchers for other purposes that they're not made aware of? And I'm aware that not every detail about these kind of things can be projected to community, but you, you just have to reflect and be mindful of the fact that um, participants are more savvy today than they were. Um, 20 years ago. And they have things that they're worried about and they're absent from. You know, that they, 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 and this is not so much about money, although money could play a role in it. They, they, don't, they don't trust that what you're doing is really in their best interest. They don't trust that you're telling them all that's important for them to know. They don't trust that what you tell them is really the truth uh, because they hear from others that someone uh, had a clinical trial that they were involved in, that there was a blood draw, that they were told that their blood was not going to be used by another research, and then they found out that someone else got a hold of their information, their sample of something. So, um, once again, I would argue that these are the kind of things to be mindful of inside before you go outside the community. And the case statement, the argument that you're making that you think will play out in community, it is one that you want to practice with inside, and then you want to then you want to test it against your champion. You know, so you've got an organizational champion that introduces you to clients. And you want, you want to have a champion that you have a true, authentic relationship with, and you want to be able to say to that champion, whether it's a, a nonprofit director or somebody, um, Lucille, I'm worried about this. I'm worried about how community is going to take this. What would you say? How do you think I should talk about this? I have a budget. I'm worried about when I talk about the whole budget, and they hear that big number, that they're going to be like, oh, well, there's a big number, but there's this little bitty tiny number that's accruing to me. Oh, there's this information about um, the sharing of my data, my information in this clinical trial, and they tell me one thing, but my friend told me something different. It's that stuff. You know? And I think it's the inside conversation, and it's especially the conversation that you have with colleagues that have done it before. You know, colleagues that said, I did this before and it blew up on me. It didn't work very well. Yeah, that's really helpful. I, I hope my answer was helpful. Yes, thank you. There's somebody I haven't seen in a long time. <laughs> very nice to see you again. Thank you for coming and sharing this heartwarming knowledge. Uh, I missed the first part of your presentation. So. This may be redundant. But can you summarize for me in a single sentence uh, the smartest thing I've ever heard about community research? And you can 
It starts off with before you tell me what to do. Show me how much you can. Yeah. Well, yeah, the, that's that's the equation that uh, Lucille and I heard at the center all the time, and that's that's something that I heard from a minister, a guy named Bob Wolfhoff in community, who's still there, uh, years ago, and this was the essence of it. He says, um, when you're interacting with the community, uh, before you show them how much you know, you have to show them how much you care. And I just saw that play out so often, you know, that showing community that you're smart may not be so impressive or so impactful on everyday people. Oh, yeah, he's smart, but he doesn't give a shit about us. Yeah, I mean, really. So that, that, was something I learned from Bob Wolfhoff about being community before you show them how much you know, you, you need to show them how much you care. Thank you for inviting us. Thanks, Tom. Great presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, so I'm a researcher at the VA. Um, we work with do suicide prevention in rural communities. Um, and I'm just wondering, like, any tips you have for uh, engaging when you're coming from an organization that's either got a bad reputation or distrust uh, within the community for, you know, good and, you know, fake reasons? Yeah, yeah I have to be uh, redundant on this. Uh, but your question is a good one, and I had that experience um, I've had that experience with a number of foundations that I've had some relationship with. And I've had it with some um, city agencies that I've um, interacted with and had some role to play with them on. And this is how it's, this is what's forgotten about neighborhoods. I use neighborhoods, communities in communities, but neighborhood, well, it's uh, um, Five Points of Curtis Park or Hillsborough or some neighborhood. Or was it some church that's down the street that's been there? And most of these, most of these churches, <coughs> uh, if we use that as an example, or small businesses, they've been there for a long time, for generations. And the people that live in community, by and large, maybe not so much anymore because of the more transient population of it. You know, a lot of people have just been living where they live for a long time. And those that have been there for generation after generation are the ones that are the most productive to talk with a, a lot of times. And uh, so I can remember going to a neighborhood representing a foundation's interest and, and promising that we were there for the long haul. And just giving this blank look. And I know what the blank look meant. The blank look meant bullshit. Because you're someone like you came here seven years ago and they did these things with us and they got what they needed from our time and attention uh, to help. And they said they were there for the long haul. And I haven't heard anything from him or her in five years. This long haul commitment is what sullies the reputation of a lot of organizations and a lot of initiatives in communities. And it's hard to overcome. I, you know, there's no easy answer to it aside from being redundant to say it's about relationships all the way down. But communities by and large, including nonprofits, have a lot of experience with people that come with projects, with ideas, with things that they think can make the community better. And we know the life of a lot of grants and philanthropy and foundations or five year kind of things, you know. And you can't control whether NIH continues the funding after five years. You get a grant from Bacori or somebody and it's a five year grant. And at the end of that five years, you think like, well, I don't have any money to do it anymore. I promised the neighborhood that we were gonna be there, but the money's run out and they didn't refund us. 
Well, community doesn't get that. They don't own that. They just own the relationship they have with you. When uh, whoever it is that's representing the organization that shows up and says, we're, we're here because we care about the health and well-being of this neighborhood, and we're here for the long haul. So I, I wish I had a better answer for you, but I just think the challenge is that once you once you fall down, uh, getting back up is what you want to do, but sometimes the community is still looking down at you and they're thinking like, ah, you didn't tell me the truth. And how do you recover from that? It's hard. And I might just add, you know, I think it's, it's always helpful um, when you're starting from a place where you think you may be in that kind of a situation to lean into it and say, I know you've had other people stand up in front of you. Um, I'd like to hear what your experience has been. What are your concerns as, as now you're looking at me? Yeah. Um, and just own that. And again, be who you are, be as authentic as you can be. And that, that will serve you well. Yeah, and Don, if I could just briefly add this. So, so when I was the director of the Center for African American Health, if I had a research partner that uh, had come to me and promised that we were going to be doing something for the long haul because they knew it was more than a five-year project to, to accomplish what we had in mind, uh, and then they applied for a grant from whatever institution it was and they did not get refunded, this is what, I, I didn't have any research bad experiences, but this is what I would hope for with a researcher that I had had some history with. I hope that that researcher would come to me and say, Grant, I'm, I'm really disappointed that we didn't get refunded. But I'm here to tell you that your, my relationship with you is important. And we didn't get this grant. We're going to try again to get some, something else. But if we don't get the grant, I want you to know that I value our relationship and I'm disappointed. But what happens oftentimes is that the nonprofit hears nothing. All right. Well, I think with that, we're going to end. Grant, thank you so much. This has been great. A round of applause. Please uh, fill out your evaluations for folks uh, that are online. Um, we have a way for you guys to, to evaluate this as well. And we look forward to seeing you again in about three months. Um, just to remind folks about the consultations that we offer through Accords and CCDSI, SNOCAP, our community research liaisons. And we'll be sending out stuff about our next round of Colorado immersion training soon. So if you want to get immersed in this work, it's a great way to do it. Thanks. If you would mind filling out our stakeholder uh, and survey, the government survey, there's no government surprises. We really appreciate it.